I'm Shelley Palmer. I'm Ross Martin. And you're listening to Think About This. On today's episode, a real live rabbi tells us about creative ways people are virtually conducting funerals, weddings, and even a bris. Hmm, and while we're talking about rituals, today's Passover. So I'm going to talk a little bit about setting up your virtual Seder. <laughs> All that and more on today's episode of Think About This. The more you listen, the less you know. So Shelly, I don't know what we did, but there is a shit storm on social media going on around our last episode. Yeah. You know, Ross, it's such a tough, tough, tough subject. People get, let's just say, very emotional about hate, hate crimes. And of course, anti-Semitism brings up the best and the worst of so many. So we were interviewing Jonathan Greenblatt. He's the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League. I thought it was a nice, friendly interview. <laughs> I, did not, I didn't expect us yeah, was. to generate the kind of response on social media, especially Twitter. And I know you got a bunch of DMs and emails in response. What were people saying? Well, we had a lot of good stuff, a lot of positive stuff. And then there was the horrible stuff. Uh, Jews are hoarding ventilators to sell them at a profit, at 100% profit. I mean, just the worst kind, the worst kind of hate, the worst kind of just conspiracy theory made up evil narrative and thankfully and and for goodness sake the positive tweets and the positive posts on facebook and instagram so far outnumbered the unfortunate ones but that stuff's out there and i wanted to delete some of it you know i wanted to like report it and then then i just said no leave it it, it it's Basically proves the point. We have a lot of work to do. I think we have to. We 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 have a choice to make, right? Which is we either sort of blow past that and put it to rest and just move on, or because it's Passover tonight, mm -hmm. and it just so happens to be we're recording our next episode. I I say we lean into the hate and we go one step further. Yeah. Then 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 the ADL we bring in a real live rabbi. If you're going to come at the Jews. Let's bring Rabbi Andy Bachman right on the show. So I think we should do that today. Let's call him. You got a phone? Yeah. So let's call. You know, I, I do have my. Wait a second, Ross. Let me get this straight. You've got your rabbi on speed dial. I do. I have my rabbi. And you know what? Like he picks up when I call Andy Bachman, picks up the phone. Rabbi Andy Bachman. Let's call him right now. Hi, Ross. Hi. Thank you for picking up because I told Shelly that I have my rabbi on speed dial and uh, if you didn't pick up, it would have been embarrassing. So where are we catching you? Uh, you're, I'm, I'm at my desk where I'm spending most of my days in, um, you know, in uh, Corona seclusion. Listen, I know you must be hard at work in the kitchen preparing for tonight's Seder. Later in our episode, we're going to be talking about Shelly Palmer's virtual Seder. Mm -hmm. So what? Well, happy Passover from Shelly and Ross. Thank you. And what are you doing for Passover? What's your plan? Happy Passover to you guys too, um, really truly. Um, our plan is to, um, well, we've just finished, you know, cleaning the house of all of our chametz and setting it aside, um, and uh, we're going to do a seder virtually, of course, like everyone. It seems uh, we're going to be connecting with Rachel's folks in Baltimore, her brother over in Ditmas Park. Um, that's the first night. The second night, I'm leading a virtual seder for a thousand people. Uh, for Russ and Daughters uh, Cafe, and uh, it's going to be a fundraiser for uh, some of their employees that they had to furlough because of the uh, hit to the economy that the virus has taken. And then the rest of the week is just connecting with other friends on Zoom for kind of, you know, friend saters and connections and stuff like that. Things have changed quite a bit. We're living in a world that we could not have imagined even a few weeks ago. And as the pandemic seems to have shut down so much all around us, you know, what goes on are all the religious obligations, ceremonies, life events, they continue. Mm -hmm. And so just like Passover and Easter, which is coming right around the corner, all these things are, are just, they're happening, but they're happening in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And so a as a religious leader, like, are you seeing new creative ways that people are conducting funerals, weddings? Is, how how is that working? You know, it, it's it, it's working great. I'll say that first of all. Um, uh, you know, I don't know that I would 
make myself a, a poster child for Zoom, but it is an unbelievable technology. Um, for the last three weeks now, I've been teaching uh, a text study at 9 a.m. and study this ancient rabbinic text called Pirkei Avot for 45 minutes. And it's it's at this point achieved a total level of intimacy and 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 brilliance and inquiry and arguments that is very much approximates uh, an in-person conversation. Um, I've done two bar mitzvahs. Uh, I've witnessed a bris on Zoom, and uh, last night did my second funeral on Zoom. Um, yeah, I can't imagine the funerals because as as the the death count rises and you know clergy like you are asked to somehow um, I don't know mark the passing mm -hmm. and observe the traditions you can't do the very thing that brings the most comfort which is to bring people together physically um or in 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 a space to honor the one departed you can't do that and and this is getting worse every day so this week and next week i would imagine the number of funerals that you're asked to do virtually will double or triple how does how do you actually do that you know, first of all, it's like worth noting that, you know, the, the call it the tech revolution that we've all kind of lived through in the last 20 years uh, has been testing these, right? I mean, I, I remember a wedding I did like five years ago for this couple that came from Silicon Valley back to New York. And one of their friends that they went to Stanford with had designed a robot um, with an iPad that roamed around the entire night of the wedding and basically was at my feet at, under the chuppah during the ceremony so that friends in California who couldn't make the wedding could watch it. Um, I've seen people, you know, video brisses or go to, you know, FaceTime for brisses and things like that. There's a, a really surprising and, and I'd say a very heartening sense of intimacy. Uh, last night, there were four speakers for the funeral um, and each one at a certain point of his or her remarks uh, burst into tears, uh, which you could see on the screen, other people then crying, and then other times told these family stories about this larger than life uh, figure from Detroit, uh, who, uh, who passed because of the virus, and, uh, and they were telling hilarious stories about him. And we were all held together in that, despite the distance and despite the, you know, the, the quote unquote, Im impersonal nature of the screen. It was really a very moving thing. So I think that, you know, I try to look at it and explain it to people like, you know, early rabbinic texts were once written on wax tablets um, and then on scrolls with ink. Um, and then the book was produced, you know, and now I can shoot a, a, a text, you know, from a website and share it on my screen with Zoom. You know, the technology is simply a tool. And I think the human capacity to connect, even from distance, is still very real, and people crave it, and they're able to receive it. And it's been a, a, an amazing thing to actually experience, I have to say. So you, you've led all kinds of congregations. Um, you were the rabbi, and uh, you, you were the, the rabbi for the largest reform synagogue in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, Beth Elohim. You ran the education program at 92nd Street Y. Mm -hmm. You, uh, I don't know if if people know this, but I'm very proud of you. You were voted one of the top rabbis in America by Newsweek. <laughs> and what was the other one? By Forbes? Um, I didn't know. Or Fortune? Who was doing that? I don't know. It could have been. It could have been. Okay. Yeah, Ford Motors, I think, but I never got the free car. So yeah. <laughs> no, but I think maybe I think your, your your next feature will probably be in Fast Company. But you are you are world renowned and and one of the most influential uh, religious leaders in America, and I you now find yourself leading a community. Uh, remotely, yeah, y y you are asked to connect and engage with a large number of people as the executive director of the Jewish Community Project in Lower Manhattan, right? And they're counting on you, yes, in this moment of crisis. So, how do you stay connected to them, and how do you inspire faith in each of them as they need it? They need it badly, more than ever. Yeah, I, I mean, thank you for those really nice words. I, I wish my parents were alive to hear them. Um, Listen, I love to write and I love to teach and that can still be done. And so words really matter, I think, for religious leaders. And so being able to share them in whatever form, a blog, a weekly email, 
or frankly, just picking up the phone and talking to people and checking in, you know, matters an enormous amount. I have an incredibly talented uh, team of educators who, who span uh, the ages from, you know, 18 months to teaching children from 18 months to, you know, 18 years. Uh, they, once it was clear that uh, this kind of seclusion was going to be necessary, they put together a plan. So we're on Zoom all day, every day in varieties of forms, even late at night, class parents, you know, like a little PTA, they get together for cocktails and talk. And we're able to kind of set up an environment where people are really seeing each other and are being mutually supportive of one another, are truly there for each other. Uh, look, I mean, I hope it doesn't last. It's I'm itching for human interaction. It's, you know, New York is like a ghost town. It's, it's dreadful. And I know everyone is really eager to get back out there and, and to connect in the way that we're actually meant to connect. But uh, for right now, we just try to respond in the moment to be as flexible, as non-judgmental as possible. You know, there are some ultra-Orthodox rabbis uh, who have decreed that one shouldn't use Zoom for a Seder, for instance, because it would break Jewish law. There are others who say you should go ahead and do it. I mean, I think, you know, like all health crises, Judaism tends to believe that the most important value that supersedes all other commandments is the preservation of life. And I would interpret that now for us very broadly to say, we have to use everything at our disposal to connect with people, especially if it means preserving life. And yet, and yet, Rabbi, I, I, I have to say it is shocking to see the level of um, uh, disdain for government decree that we are seeing in the Orthodox Jewish community. Right. There are so many rabbis like you or not like you who are leading large congregations and communities right, right there in New York and across the country who have said, you know what? We're meeting anyway. Like, like we're not going online. <laughs> we're all going to get together. And every day we see these images, not just the Jewish community. You see mega churches doing the same thing. You see small churches doing the same thing, but large congregations mm -hmm. who, who have just, just defied, defied the order. What are they doing? They're exercising a very peculiar manifestation of American civil religion, which is the underbelly of the separation of church and state. You know, the founders wanted to separate church and state because they very much believed in the values of a secular republic. And they themselves understood that, you know, the early Americans were escaping uh, religious persecution. And so they wanted to encode that. The underbelly of that is that people think that they're beyond the state. And that's, to a certain degree, what you see in extreme communities, Christian, Muslim, uh, some of these Orthodox communities as well, where they really see their faith as superseding uh, democratic values. And so the government, for people of fervent faith, is, is, a, temporary, uh, is, a, is, a, is a is a temporary imposition on, on their own sense of expression of faith. So who listens to the government if you're representing a 5,000-year a tradition? Who needs to listen to the government if your, if your Messiah uh, can save you by a declaration of faith? And, and so uh, this becomes the, the troubling game um, that is then put into the hands of political leaders. Uh, in New York, Mayor de Blasio said uh, yesterday that he's going to be speaking to the leaders of some of these Hasidic communities, which... Uh, still have gatherings. You know, we'll see how well he does. He doesn't have the greatest track record um, standing up to those communities. But it's, I think, fundamentally, it's really about understanding that for extreme religious expression, uh, the state is, uh, is you know, a, a Caesar only to be tolerated when necessary. Other than that, mm. it, all obedience and faith is to God. Um, and it, it can lead to uh, dangerous expressions, of course, in, in all sorts of ways. So at a Hasidic funeral, you'll have people showing up and not wearing masks or, you know, this nutty evangelical preacher who has been saying that the COVID virus is a punishment uh, to the Jews for not accepting Jesus. And if you just accept Jesus, uh, you'll be safe from the virus. And, you know, these kinds of things whip people into, the fer into a fervor that's not all that different from, let's say, some of the anti-vaxxers who are out there or, you know, frankly, people who are looking over their shoulder waiting for a flying saucer to come down and save us all from this. Though if you were driving the flying saucer, Ross, I would trust it. There aren't too many No, others. don't trust me. No, the only person on this, the only person, <laughs> shh, 
Shelly is the one you want driving the flying saucer. <laughs> so, Andy, we know the Amish rejected the federal government and down to the way that they put pins in their clothing mm-hmm. t- instead of buttons because they feel like buttons are military. And I, I, I've sat through all that. And But the idea that a group of religious leaders would would put their flock at risk knowing that it is being in proximity of one another at the moment that gives you the best chance of transmitting the virus to each other, that kind of makes no sense to me. That just makes no sense. But that's me. No, it, it's you and it's actually millions of others, Shelley. And it's, it's, you know, in this, it's important to remember that besides a disdain for government, there is also a disturbing disdain for science, for math. Um, and this is in many ways what you see playing out in some segments of the press briefings that the president gives. And then in its most extreme form, you see it playing out in religious communities, uh, where science, math, English language, let's say in New York are not taught at the level that they should be taught at in yeshivas, uh, which is, ends up doing a great disservice to those communities. And so the disdain for science leads people to undervalue it, if you know, if not ignore it altogether. Well, all I can say is that America has picked an incredibly unfortunate decade to make it cool <laughs> to be stupid because the scientific method, <laughs> right? The scientific method is your best chance at the moment. It is your very best chance for survival. I want to just tell you a personal story. So one of the people in our study group, and she's a member of our board. Her name is Marguerite Weissendanger. And she's uh, half Swiss, half Chinese. She grew up in Paris. She came to America. uh, And in medical school, she fell in love with Judaism because of one of her instructors who invited her to a Seder. She's a Jew, uh, married, you know, has a wonderful family. uh, And she is a rheumatologist. And daily in the first days of the outbreak, at the beginning of the call, she was giving us these updates. Here's what the hospital looks like today. She's at Mount Sinai. Here's what it looks like today. And the morning she got on the call, she had this huge smile on her face and we we're all terrified. Like what's going to happen today in New York? She said something really exciting happened today. In the lab at Mount Sinai, we learned that if you've tested positive, we can take your plasma and there are antibodies in the plasma that p- can be used to fight COVID-19 at an early stage. And so now we're taking those samples and we're deploying it. And she was literally like overwhelmed with joy. And I, I mean, I get goosebumps still thinking about it, that there are these people who are toiling away at the science, making mistakes, just like Einstein said, being willing to be outsmarted, you know, tomorrow. Um, but they're doing it because they believe fervently both in the science and the preservation of human life. I love that, you know, and I find that so beautiful. Well, from, from one Jew, Albert Einstein, to another, Andy Bachman. Uh, Andy, I, I think for me, you're, you're the same as Albert Einstein in my life in, in that you inspire me just as much as he did. Can you uh, offer us some words of wisdom or inspiration as we head into Passover and Easter that we can all take with us in such a, uh, such a difficult time for everyone? I would say to you that, yes, I, I'm more than happy to do that. I think a lot these days about one of my favorite rabbis whose name was Kalanimus Kalman Shapiro, and he was a rabbi in the Warsaw Ghetto. We only know of his writings because um, he had buried them in a milk can, like many people did in the ghetto, and they were found after the war, after he was killed, but they exist. And they are a representative sample of a person who was living in the darkest of circumstances, celebrating Passover under the most trying of circumstances, but celebrating Passover because he insisted on repeating over and over to his community. And this was a Hasidic rabbi who taught Bundists and communists and socialists and secularists and religious people in the Warsaw Ghetto. And he felt that it was critically important to understand that the power of these narratives remind us that they are transcendent stories, that the times that we're living in uh, uh, pass and the trials pass. But the larger... Uh, a tapestry of the values that we're meant to live by, goodness, kindness, loving thy neighbor as thyself, those persist. And so the Passover Seder says all people deserve to be free. No one deserves to live in servitude. And that's a story that needs to be told and has been told for 3,000 years. And I know it's going to be told beyond us because we're telling it now. 
And so I, I find that to be enormously inspiring um, uh, for me and for my family. And I try to teach it to as many people as possible. We will make it through uh, as, as, as a humanity by our scientific method and our ingenuity, but also by holding on to the narrative values that uh, bind us to one another as human beings. Wow. Think about that. Andy, thank you so much. We wish you a happy Passover tonight and love to you and your family and be safe. Thank you. A happy Passover to you as well. Yes. All right. You guys too. Great talking. Thank you. Take good care. Appreciate it. So Shelly, I was invited to three virtual seders tonight. Which makes me feel First of all, both good, which makes me feel good because I feel popular, but also bad because I don't, I'm not actually, I don't have a Seder of my own here actually happening. So I actually have to be on Zoom to experience Seder action tonight. One of those Seders, which is definitely going to be the best, is yours. Wow. And I know most, most people are not invited to yours because that would be mayhem. And if I if I were if I were to give people the link to your Seder, I'm afraid you'd be Zoom bombed in the middle of the four questions. So I'm not doing probably. That. Yeah. But can you tell people what are you planning for this evening? So this is really kind of super fun. Um, obviously, we're in exile uh, up in Vermont, yep. and we've got. I'm very very blessed and lucky to have my uh, three kids and my grandkids up here, and so we're gonna have a real physical Seder, which for those of you who don't uh, have Seders, it's basically a dinner party with a script. So we're going to have 10 people here around the table, but we're going to have, we usually have about 45 people at Passover. And this year, two things have happened that are fantastic. One, we're going to have more than 45 people, which is fascinating. We're going to get a chance to have cousins who live in California and in Oregon and uh, who never abroad, actually abroad, get to come who never never get to come so it's going to actually be a much more inclusive uh evening than normal and uh, what we've done is uh prepared a kind of an interesting zoom setup i've got three things that might help people if if they're thinking about doing this all right tell us so first generally only one device can be on in a room on zoom and the reason for that is the microphone and the speakers so you can have more than one zoom camera angle if you turn the speakers off if it's a smartphone turn the volume all the way down and mute the microphone then you have only one microphone generally the laptop for the leader but you can have other people be quote designated camera people and whoever is leading the you you choose a co-host which we will do and someone will be able to choose camera angle so whoever's speaking around the main table can actually be on camera which is a much better experience than putting a laptop on the shelf somewhere and trying to show like 10 people sitting around a table it's different if you're really by yourself and you're leading the seder right into your uh, webcam because then obviously that's super easy but if you're asking people to attend a bigger gathering or a gathering that's already happening you need to get a little creative well i'm going to interrupt you here for one second shelly because everybody who's listening right now that isn't jewish is like why do i care but let me tell you why you care. It's just about Easter, right? Passover this year is a dress rehearsal from a technology perspective for Easter. And every other dinner. And every other dinner that you're going to do. And by the way, like I'm guaranteeing you, you probably have some big life event that you got to celebrate in the next two, three months. And you're going to be Zooming just like this. Yep. So take note. It's not just for the Jews. No, it All right, really Shelley, isn't. So Shelley, what else? So the camera angle thing is important. Then the... This is, uh, as you know, Ross, very well, this is a ritual that has some food associated with it. And most importantly, it has a script. You're reading from a book and the book has responsive reading and collective reading and then individuals read. So this isn't a whole lot different from having people give toasts or having people do anything in, in a large conference. But what does make it different is that you need everyone on, quote, the same page, unquote. And in this case, they have to be on the actual same page. So the book we read from is called the Haggadah. Every Jew listening knows that. And everybody who isn't Jewish doesn't. It's basically a story, the story of Passover. It's from the Ten Commandments, the Charlton Heston movie. It's the story of the Exodus. Let my people go. And we go around the table and each person reads a certain portion. The way you have to do this is you have to have a book that everybody's reading from. So I made a PDF file. And the way I did that was I took the book, I scanned it, 
Then I used optical character recognition, OCR software. So I didn't have to retype the whole book and I pulled it into a word document. Now that was actually easier to do than it sounded. Basically it was a quick scan and Adobe Acrobat had some OCR software in it. And I was able to easily, very easily copy and paste all the text into a word document. So you're using the regular Haggadah that you normally use. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you've got it in a word document yes. and you've assigned parts or you have, you know where the parts are yeah. and you're going to share, and then you're going to share that screen. No, or no? I, no. And that's what I thought I was going to do. I actually made right. a website and then I realized this isn't going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is by about the third cup of wine, you are always telling somebody what uncle so-and-so it's page 26 in the middle, right? You're always doing that. So yeah, because I'm, uncle so-and-so is like sleeping or drunk or distracted. Or, or all or all of that. So <laughs> you need pages. So I made a PDF file from this Word document that has real page numbers and sections. And I named sections in a way that they're not named in the normal Haggadah so that I knew we'll all know where we always are. And I distributed this as a pre-read and let everybody know what's going to happen. So I gave everybody instructions about how to log into Zoom, how to set up their cameras, how to set up either their um, smartphones, their laptops, or their desktops if they're going to do it, how to deal with lighting or not lighting, how to just make it as good as possible. And because a lot of people are very familiar with Zoom, right? From just this last couple of weeks doing regular meetings. The only thing different here is that we're going to have a meal and we're also going to go around and you can't be that chit chatty because it does get super distracting if more than one person is talking in a Zoom meeting, right? It gets hard to manage. So let me ask you this. The one part that a lot of people know, even if they're not Jewish, about the Passover Seder is there's a moment where you hide a piece of the matzah, which is called the Afi Komen, mm -hmm. and people have to try to find it. And nobody at the table gets dessert until it's found. Right. And also, whoever finds it usually makes some cash or yep. has some kind of benefit from finding it. Mm -hmm. So, what are you going to do with the Afi Komen? Are you going to, is it like an Easter egg somewhere on the internet? What are you going to do? to hide the Afi Komen for all the people? Because you have dozens of people tuning in for this thing. We do. And so we have done two things. One, for my granddaughters who will be with us, we have done it physically. We have a plan to hide it in the house. However, we have children joining us from all over the country. And so what I did was I wrote a very, very simple, super simple um, game that you can play on your smart it's it, it's a mobile web game but you know at some point during your seder people are just going to give up and stop listening to you and just drink and hang out and it's just going to become a zoom passover party you know uh, that i or am, are you going to try to be the guy are you going to be like the 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 dad the patriarch that like insists that everyone follow the haggadah so we throw the singularly most irreverent seder in probably the world. It's just, it. I'm surprised that I have not been struck by lightning several times um, <laughs> in my life. Uh, I am not that guy, but we are, to me, Ross, this is about tradition more than anything. And to get serious for a second, doesn't matter if you're religious or you're not religious, we all come from somewhere. And where I come from, my tradition, my ancestors, the people who came over from the old country, this was what they did once a year. They gathered around a table, they told this particular story and they did it with love and they did it with intentionality and they did it faithfully every year. I remember them fondly from childhood and all we're trying to do here is what every family, no matter what their religion is trying to do, and that is to create a big room that is filled with love, that is filled with tradition, that is filled with the the good memories of, of our ancestors and of our uh, parents and grandparents and those who are not with us anymore and trying to create new memories for our children and grandchildren to have Sweet. and keep I love it. their whole life. And that's, that's, that's all this is. And if we can do that virtually or physically, it doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, there's some tools where there's a will, there's a way, but there's a tremendous will, right? There's a tremendous yeah. will just to make this a very, very inclusive event literally filled with love. That's what we're trying to do. I love it. Happy Passover, my friend. Chag Sameach. So Shelly, as everybody heard from Rabbi Andy, there is, it's, it's not like weddings and funerals and brisses and other rituals just stop in a pandemic. Like 
everything still has to get done yep. and it's just mo it's moving online right and we have tools to do that mm -hmm. but you do need you do need a spiritual leader yes and i know to many you are a spiritual leader <laughs> I, i'm not sure i'm not sure that people know that robert our producer and i we are both universal life ministers did you know that wait a minute robert am i are you am I telling the truth robert you are telling the truth and have you ever officiated over a bris or a wedding or a funeral <laughs> i have officiated five weddings and are any are any of them still married all of them are still married <laughs> yes okay <laughs> now ross okay. i i haven't done any yet but but i i think i'd be very i've been the backup three times and they've never had to go to me so ross i i know yes. why robert who is very pious and and <laughs> introspective and why quiet, why did i do quiet, it decided yeah. to do that but what what was what possessed you i think is the word i'm looking for i mean you never know when when you know your your career is gonna go south and i find it's a good <laughs> it's a, i think look it's a good backup career right my robert am i right it absolutely is although i've never charged for it oh shit maybe that's why i'm not getting any gigs <laughs> think about that <laughs> I think you'll be just fine, Ross. You too, Shelly. And happy Passover to you and your families. And happy Easter to you, Robert. Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating, wash your hands, and stay home. And listen to other episodes of Think About This with Shelly Palmer and Ross Martin. If you think you know less than you did before, just wait until our next episode on the Westwood One Podcast Network.